is what we have. And I'll give you an example. We always talk about uh, the war on drugs. We always talk about how the war on drugs was uh, uh, to give the system probable cause. Well, first it broke the back of this, the, the rebellion. When drugs hit the black cities, that did away with all the old community we had where you didn't lock your doors, where you were friendly to each other. By 1970, we had bars on our windows. That's something you never had seen before. You know, bars on our windows. Uh, it was then later on, black on black crime came in. By the time we didn't move through the mid 70s, that's the terminology, black on black crime. Okay, now the thing that we have with the politicians and what have you, see on the 4th of July, you can remember that right here in America, there was only demonstrations, there was hardly no killings. You notice that? Go back a month ago, there wasn't no killings amongst us. On the 4th of July, after the demonstration stopped, we have an explosion of killings, black people killing. Even this dictator down there got a collage, a picture, like almost album of young black people and children who've been killed by each other. That's probable cause, that's an excuse. Okay, now here's the thing. The, the mayors and the congressmen do not go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is drugs. The root of the problem is the drug dealing is which gave uh, the gangs and what have you did not exist in our cities. No, excuse me. L.A., Chicago, those are gang cities. I mean, real life. New York on a light level, but Chicago is a gang city. Los Angeles is a gang city. The other cities in California have crews. Like they have crews, they, had, they used to have crews around here. This crew, 17th Street crew, this crew, you know what I mean? All that Eastgate crew, you know. But they didn't have gangs. Like where you have a thousand people in your gang. You know what I mean? And the gang leaders have, have real power. You know what I mean? They run something. Okay, they don't have anything in D.C. like Crips and Bloods and all that, uh, which Crips and Bloods spread all over the West Coast. They come, they've been coming east for a long time. Just as a footnote, when the Soviet Union broke up, they had 300 ex extra FBI agents. Does anybody know what they did with them? They put them on black gangs in America. Study it. Around 1990, 1990, that's what, imagine now, you go from the big, mean Soviet Union that everybody's afraid of, and under that is black gangs. Under that is black gangs. Okay. So, uh, this love for black people and wanting to uh, defend black people is so much hypocrisy, it'll make you sick of the stomach. Uh, the drug war is a door opener to the black community. Number one, uh, it classifies the black community as a a high crime community. When you live in a high crime neighborhood, then the threshold for illegal searches and seizures are different because they call it a high crime area. Okay, so hypocrisy, drug war, this is technically a dictatorship. It's perpetrated on black and brown and now white people. The drug problem didn't move from just black and brown 
to white. Opiates, 50,000, 70,000 white people dying per year now. And the white people are selling them the drugs. They just get a slap on the wrist, something like that. Or <laughs> they'll make a profit of a trillion dollars and they'll fine them $5 million. This is ridiculous, right? <laughs> okay, they bribe all the doctors and say opiates is good and they have a pain industry. You know what I mean? They had a real pain industry and everybody came, they said they had pain and then they got addicted to all that Oxycontin and everything. And then they couldn't keep up with the habits so they started using heroin. Can you imagine how dirty it was, how they hooked them white people. First, they given them prescription drugs by the bucket load. They had a doctor give them all that stuff. And then after that, they graduate down or degrade down to the use of heroin. It's, it's unbelievable. This is all opiates, but let me keep on. The dictatorship when a country starts talking about for your safety, for your security, you know, like white folks don't like to hear that talk. When they, you start talking about helping them with security, securing them, they start talking about freedom in a hurry. You ever notice that? As soon as you're talking about, because that's the door that the government walks in, the safety door, the security door, that's the door that Adolf Hitler walked in. We want to secure you. We want the defense of the fatherland. That's, that's Trump. I'm going to defend America and I'm going to make America again. Right? It's, one, it's pure Adolf Hitlerism. We call him Adolf Hitler Jr. Because see, Trump, it looks like he's not going to get away with it. Adolf Hitler got away with it. Now imagine where the world was 10 years after he started that stuff. Millions of people died in World War II because they didn't stop that bomb. Right? And the militarism in Japan. Can you imagine the millions of people that died just in Europe alone the million, you know, it was 27 million Russians died in World War II. They said 27 or 29. They settled with 27. 27 million people in one country died. Don't think about France and the Netherlands and all that Denmark. This is what these demagogues, the dictators do. Uh, we're, we're in a serious situation right now. Uh, and we're going to take action starting right now. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, later. So we're going to get out to people. The White House, like we've been going, we get, get out to the Congress where we've been going. Uh, the MLK Memorial down there. We have to take this message to the people. This is part of our, I'll get back to that later. Hypocrisy, the drug war, dictatorship. It's hypocrisy because the drug war, you don't go and say, I'm here to send federal troops. You hear the mayor? Please go home. We don't want you here, right? In Portland, Oregon, the man is right. They tear gassed the mayor today or yesterday. This, he, he told them, he said, if you go tear gas the people, you're going to tear gas me. And they, did. They, they, hey man, they rolled on. They, look, Donald Trump. No, he, he gave his lecture. Did you see that lecture he gave? He was out there with the people. Yeah. The mayor said, if you tear gas the people, you're going to tear gas me. They tear gas today. The mayor of Portland, Oregon. Now, you got to remember what Portland, you know, Portland, Oregon has still been, uh, been, been out demonstrating. 
Okay, I'm from the West Coast, so I know the cities. Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. You know, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, that used to be exile for America. If you messed up in a company in New York, you know, that's one block from Canada. That's far as you could go in those days. To still be in the U.S., they'd send you to Seattle. But in Seattle, Washington, in Portland, Oregon, in Seattle, Washington, they had, when I was in the penitentiary up in Stillicum, Washington, up at McNeil Island, uh, they had people, and I used to go up there to escape to read the, the California stuff, you know. And I, I went up there, and I saw people my age that was from mixed marriages. In other words, back in the 40s, and all way back, they had mixed marriages in Seattle. They was way, they was way ahead of. Now, Portland, Oregon, the liberals in California and the people in Washington, was, they, they were sad. I mean, they done migrated the liberals and what have you, so Portland, Oregon is a liberal city. It's a port city. The Columbia River empties right there. You remember Lewis and Clark, maybe you don't. Anyway, it empties right there into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, Portland has that look of, uh, it has a San Francisco type look. I used to give a lot of lectures there. But Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is also green. You know, the evergreen state is up there in Washington. It is green, it rains a lot up there. And Oregon is right below it. So part of it is very green also. So, but the liberals, the reason, you gotta look at it now. The only place where they haven't been, uh, where they continue to demonstrate is Portland, Oregon. Why? Because it's a super liberal, you know, white. They treat Negroes all right up there. but well, they don't treat them all right. But anyway, they, it's not a bad, uh, you can see what it is. For the mayor to come out, for the mayor to come out and say, hey man, we don't want you up here. And look what the police, the federal police are doing. No badges, no nothing on them, no identify. They're ninja, they grabbing people and dumping them in vans and question. This is like, this is Gestapo. You know, and now the Negro, he going along, he ain't paying no attention at all. But white folks is paranoid. They said, we don't want this. We don't want this. And now if the Negro mayors, see, if Donald Trump was serious, he would go after drugs. Drugs coming into America? Because don't know Negroes bring no drugs in America, right? Just to be brief, look, Colombia, cocaine and all of that. I thought it was seven U.S. military bases down there, but somebody said it was 17. Why the U.S. military went down there? The U.S. military went down there because uh, the guerrilleros, the guerrilla groups, got into the drug trade decades ago. And when they got into the drug trade, hey, man, their rebellion picked up. I mean, remember, they could buy the best guns. They could pay their people salaries. Did you know they was in the drug trade? That's why the U.S. and they was interfering with the U.S. drug trade. So they sent the U.S. military down there to technically guard their shipments, to safeguard their shipments, and then to fight the guerrilleros, the guerrillas, to fight them physically. So that within the uh, last two, three years back, they had to make a treaty with the Colombian government because the U.S. military went down there. You know, like you're cutting in on my, our stuff and you can buy better weapons than, than the police got, you know. 
they had to stop it. Okay, in Mexico, the big drug trade, the smartest thing for the drug barons to do in Mexico would have a friendship pact like they used to a long time ago. Stop killing each other because all the guns for killing down there comes from up here. It's so like all, the, they talk about sending the police to Kansas City and St. Louis. Well, that's where they manufacture it. They, they, all them Smith and Wesson, they manufacture the stuff there. Yeah, if, why, why, if you want to stop the guns, don't mess with uh, the Second Amendment, right? Use the ATF. They're supposed to be so smart, right? They're like FBI agents, except they're working with uh, uh, tobacco and firearms, right? Why don't, they, why don't you stop them? No, they make sure guns get down to Mexico. That's why they're averaging 35,000 people a year getting slaughtered by each other in Mexico. It's a control mechanism to control the gangs so when they get a little big, they have the other gang attack them. And if the other one get a little, when they get a little too big, you notice don't nobody stay around no long time. There was a, actually, there was something in CNN two or three years ago mm -hmm. about weapons winding up missing in Mexico. They called it the Fast and Furious case, but yeah. kind of, it was mainstream news that, you know, man, they actually let that get out, you know. Yeah, what, they gave them weapons. right down there. Okay, the black neighborhood. When we were fighting the police in the late 60s and early 70s, it was hard to get weapons. Uh, that's why Angela Davis went to jail because she bought some weapons for Jonathan Jackson, George Jackson's brother back in those days. And then they, uh, she went to jail temporarily for that. But the point is this, when I came back to America by 73 and 74, all the gangs in LA had all the weapons they wanted. And you know the main weapon in those days was a Uzi. Uzi is an Israeli weapon. They just came out in those days. The Uzi, that machine pistol, that just came out in 73, 74. Yeah, it just came out then and all the gangs had them. That means that when you are fighting the black, the black people were fighting white police, it was hard to get guns. When they flooded the black community with drugs and the rebellion is over, you can get all the guns you want. There's articles in the black newspapers, LA Sentinel and all that, I'm just saying. So this right now is a criminal move. If Donald Trump wanted to uh, secure the black community and help the black community with drugs, he would stop the drugs from coming in. When you stop the drugs from coming in, there's no reason for the drug dealers to fight each other. Right? No reason for the communities to fight each other. Why? Because they remove the reason for the fight, drug territory and the turnover of money, you know, okay. So the reason, if Donald Trump wanted to help, that's what he would do. He would do something with, uh, which he couldn't, I mean, because uh, y'all remember Iran-Contra, well, he didn't heard about it. Iran-Contra and all that. Everybody knows that drugs are, the, the CIAF, Everybody knows that. I know it personally. I lived down there and I watched it. And I was right in the flow, you know. I mean, I was right in the mix. Do you know they had a, Effie Dose, F2, is a drug, anti-drug uh, group in, uh, in Colombia. The police, you know, so. I was telling our con connection, oh, here's what happened. I read in the New York Times, 
because the New York Times would come down there by plane and you'd read them the next day. And I read in El Tiempo, but it was in Spanish. My Spanish wasn't that good at first. It came out right away. When I got to the New York Times, I really understood it. They're going to send helicopters, $55 million down to Columbia to help stop fighting drugs. And I went to the our people, I said, man, we in trouble now. I said, okay, Pastor, what's going on? Look, they going to send down helicopters. They going to send down, and the more I talked, the more they laughed. And, and I mean, they was really rolling on the floor. They said, man, our connections, they do target practicing with DAS, Departamento Internal Seguridad. In Colombia, DAS is like the FBI. Our connections, you know, like you did, you practice weapons with J. Edgar Hoover or somebody. That's the way we, we was hooked up like that. <laughs> they were, and the more I told them, man, it's going to be, it's, they, was, they was laughing so hard. I mean, if you roll the camera back, they would, they really enjoyed that laugh. I mean, you know when, you, when it hurts your stomach a little bit and you just be like that? They was really rolling. And then before I left, that's when they started sending the military down because the guerrilla armies got into drugs. And when they got into cocaine, they could buy the best weapons, new weapons. They could, uh, they sent the military down a few years later to stop that. You cutting in on our business and to destroy them. And that's what happened because the Colombian military was well armed, but you could buy them off, uh, you know, you buy off a general, like in Mexico. <laughs> You could buy everything if you, anyway, let me get back to, if these black mayors and Congress people were serious, they would tell the government, they would tell the government, hey, if you wanna help black people stop putting the drugs in our community, cause there is no one thing I'd never met, is black smugglers of cocaine. I just never met any. And the only guy that was doing, doing that, Haran, he went over there one, two trips maybe. I was an American gangster. You know, his story and my story is exactly the same, except his was heroin and mine was cocaine. Yeah, it was it's almost the same story, except of course he made more money. But the first Negro to bring Tons of uh, uh, Pia Haran here, and he made big money. There was nobody else bringing no uh, pure cocaine. Here. Anyway, so what I'm saying is I know the hypocrisy of the drug war. The drug war gives you probable cause to harass the black community. Black and brown, now white victims. The door is safety. Whenever they tell you that we want to keep you safe, right, that's what Donald Trump is saying. Break out running. Break out running, duck, or do whatever you can. Okay. And also, what's the longest war they've ever fought in America? The drug war. They had a program called The Longest War. That was 10 years ago. That was 40 years. Now, the other thing about just socially, remember in America, well, you, if you've watched TV and you remember, in 1920, they prohibited alcohol, called prohibition. Before in America, the biggest crime was gambling and prostitution. That's where you made your money. 
when alcohol, when they made alcohol illegal, and you know Chicago's right up across from Canada. Chicago, you can get on. Imagine them days. You'd buy all that whiskey in Canada and send it right across the Great Lakes to Chicago. That's why Al Capone got so big. Do you know he would have been a billionaire today because he made $720,000 per week in those days. That's it, that money. The gangs exploded. After 10 years, they said prohibition is not working. And the other things is producing criminal organizations that will eventually be able to challenge the government. They already challenge in each city, like, like in Chicago and in New York, the crime bosses could pay off, uh, okay, after you can pay off DAs, after you can, pretty soon you can get somebody in the governor's house. Yeah, Dewey and all those guys, you know, up there in New York, yeah, he was a DA. They, anyway, I was just thinking of a movie that had that scene in it. What was the Negro gangster that uh, Fishburn, Louis, Fishburn played? Uh, no, 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 not Deep Cover. He played a 1920s gangster. It was a real person, actually. Huh? Bumpy Johnson. Bumpy Johnson from down here. Bumpy Johnson, that's right. Bumpy Johnson was actually a real person. Bumpy Johnson was big, right? Bumpy Johnson, them, hooking up with Italians, they was able to buy the city government. If you can buy the DA, they ain't gonna bother you no more, right? If you can buy the DA, if the DA give him enough money, he can run for governor, right? And if you can get to the governorship, some of them got the governorship. The point I'm making is this. When Franklin Roosevelt saw that uh, this is not working, 12 years later, they repealed prohibition. And the other thing was gangs got so strong and so heavy and so much money, they said, we got to stop this because they'll be able to, uh, you can't stop them because everybody gonna drink, right? This is like, you can't stop drugs, so you might as well legalize them, like they legalize alcohol, right? I mean, not for us as Muslims, but they might as well legalize drugs. They getting ready to do it, and remember, drugs was not illegal till the Harrison Act in 1914. Remember what was in Coca-Cola in the old days? You didn't have to snort your blows. You could go down there and get you some, well, you could buy cocaine. You could got cocaine, heroin, anything that they made. Of course. It was legal. You know who made it legal, illegal? The AMA, when they got big enough, the American Medical Association. Why? The snake oil. Uh, you, you know, them bottles they'd have, the, they called it snake oil. They, it was like a cure in a bottle. For one bottle, they guarantee, you know, the snake oil man, that's what they mean. He would guarantee you this bottle, uh, snake oil, this bottle, he didn't call it snake oil. He'd call it Uncle Bob's Magic, magic Elixir or somebody. Half, half of them traveled around in a, with a wagon and you know what I mean? From town to town and they would sell it for one dollar. Now you, the dollar don't sound like much now, but if you made $20 a month, a dollar was a dollar, that was a day's salary. That was what you, okay. Now what was snake oil? Did it work? Of course it did. It had it had a speed ball. It had cocaine, right, to pick you up and give you a lift, and it had heroin to kill the pain, whatever your pain was, and they wasn't lying. 
Oh, you're going to die next week of soon. And then once you get addicted to snake oil, you got to buy it. But everybody, it was only, it was cheap, you know, just one dollar for a little drink. And cough syrup with codeine in it and all that, they just got rid of cough syrup a few years ago. You know, that, cough, that syrup, they, everybody, man, I got to get me some syrup, codeine. Okay, drugs was legal in those days. And all you had to do was have your formula. Now you got to mention, when he told you this is going to cure anything you got, it felt like he was telling the truth. Why? Because the heroin, I don't care what pain you had, right? The opium was going to knock it out. It ain't going to cure cancer. It ain't going to cure nothing you got but pain. And then the cocaine in there going to boost you up. That's why we call it a speedball, speedball, a mixture of cocaine. It just, hey man, they could get over on that right now. <laughs> but the doctor said we got to stop them from having that because it's taking too much money from them. People going to the snake oil man and getting a bottle of that stuff instead of coming to him. So when the American Medical Association, the AMA got big enough, they had the Harrison Act passed in 1914. Okay, let's get back to uh, Adolf Hitler Jr. The Adolf Hitler Jr. show is Donald Trump right now. You got to realize constitutionally what's going on. He's violating the governor down there in Missouri and them other places, they saying you got to stay out of here. Right? The city, the mayor, the only, uh, the mayor in Chicago told him the same thing, but she's been kind of backpedaling a little bit. But here's the thing. Instead of him talking about we're going to keep you safe, that's what he's saying, Right? the mayors ought to have enough courage to tell him that it's not guns killing people, it's these drugs and this other stuff that you put in here. And as long as those drugs, see, here's the thing. The, the new world we're going to live in, we're going to live on total lockdown dictatorship, or we're going to be freer. What I mean, freer. If drugs are not illegal, that means you have a strong, do you know how many, you want to stop crime? What percentage of crime is, is uh, linked to drugs? Anybody know? 80%. 80%. This is standard, a little higher, a little lower. This is standard, 80% of crime. Look, in the penitentiary, why are people in crime? either directly with drugs or burglaries to get money to buy drugs or robberies to get money to buy drugs or scams to get money to buy drugs, right? Assaults to get money to buy drugs. Paranoia because you shot the man because you was paranoid off crank or something and you thought he was going to do something to you. And you get real paranoid. You get juiced up off that stuff. Okay, so we'll live in a world that's kind of free or we'll live in a dictatorship. That thing of security, police agencies watching you, if you knew the number of increased police agency and authority that they have based on drugs alone, The number of people in the penitentiary, unbelievable. The amount of money we spend on the police agencies, right? The court system, go down there, it's drugs. And in front of everybody, they send, these big white folks are jail, they in the day, they out tomorrow, or they had a big lawyer, right? 
Now here's, here's, look how crazy this man is. What was the guy, Epstein or something? Okay. Now the girl that was helping him is in court now. What did Don say? I hope she gets, I hope they treat her well. I hope, okay, what about the niggas then? Right? I hope they fix the niggas up. I, they, I don't want to see them go to jail, right? Right? He ain't saying that. But the white lady, they had they pedophiles. The pedophile ring. This lady was setting up the young girls, 14, 15. You know what I mean? Hey, this is a good deal. You're going to get your education. You're going to, you know what I mean? And for them, they probably poor. I mean, you know, but the, it's pedophile. She was arranging all that for the other guy. They just, they killed him. And Epson, you think he just died? You think he hung himself? Heck no. Man, they come, they hung that man. And they, they treated him like a nigga. You know, he committed suicide. So do black people. So did the young girl down in Texas commit suicide. The one that was feisty and argued and everything. Next day she's depressed and commits suicide. You can believe it if you want. You can believe anything them people tell you. It's up to you. I don't care. I'm just telling you, we told everybody this stuff from the very beginning. That number one, that stuff is all a fraud. The demonstrations, the killing of the brother, the arrangements, all of that is a fraud. Remember when we was down there and we were saying, this is a fraud, this is Hollywoodism, and they stopped. You know why they stopped? Because they was embarrassed. Because we there telling them, look at that. Da, 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 da. And they had to stop. Okay. We're going to be doing that. That's what we're getting ready for right now. We, our mission is clear now. Okay. America needs a rescue. All of America. That's why, if you notice, we've been easing toward uh, America. You know, America the good. Why we've been easing toward that? Because it's clear that we live in a, a tragic time, but a blessed time. That we have an opportunity, and I hope the other Muslims get in on this. We have an opportunity to help the whole of America. Just think, if America go down, if it burns up and everything, that means your mother burns up with them, your uncle, your nephew, right? <laughs> like it or not, we're Americans, right? So we want the system changed. We want the policies changed, right? But we want to rescue the people. The people are victims. And I'm telling you, They ran that stuff right up and down the street and demonstrated us for about two, three weeks, and they didn't change the dialogue. Is there any more dialogue about Black Lives Matter? No, police lives matter, right? And and police fund defunding the police. We got to pro fund refund the police. We got to right right now, right today. Because all that was set up and arranged. The stuff that is happening right now <clears throat> is a sloppy job that they have really failed on putting it across, but it's still a danger. Let me explain it like this. When Trump did what he did with the uh, flash bombs and all that downtown, okay. Uh, and then the military people. That was his move to try to get uh, the military on his side. The military rebelled. He said, oh, boy. I mean, they big boys. So we ain't into that. The military. Safety number one. So technically, we semi-safe. But not Don. Don is federalizing everybody he can. 
So those troops that are going to Portland, those troops that he has sent, they're not, they're all other, do you know he's got the border con patrol, much he talked about the border, going to leave the border, just, just when we get back, listen to the news, and they're going to come up and be running around in cities. And the white folks say, they're not even trained for that. Who cares? This man, right, wants to get reelected. And it's a struggle with himself. His ego wants to be reelected because I'm Big Don. But his old lazy body don't want it. That's too much work. Right? People bothering you all the time. He's sitting up eating his Big Macs and stuff. And he said, what? Can you imagine? Look at every other president. They had turned gray. Real soon. Obama was black headed. He may have four, five black and gray hair. That's it. His head was white as snow when he come out of there. Because it bothered, it just work, work, work. You don't get no rest. You don't get no nothing. You know what I mean? And Don don't like that. Don is a bum. Don don't, ain't never worked a day in his life. He just stole and steal from the people and sham. He's a scam artist. Can you imagine a president that had 51 cases against him when he went, became president? 51. And then nobody said, man, that's a lot of cases. You know what I mean? You could have paid all those people. Trump University, <laughs> it's like this piece of paper. It's like this thing here. It ain't got nothing in it. That's what a Trump diploma is, nothing. The people that are suing him, you hear that? They suing him. He's a scam artist, huh? Yeah, they just they said this stuff ain't nothing, man. You didn't lie to us. Talking about you gonna get a job up in the flying industry, floating industry, and everything. So we're now moving towards uh, what we call a counter dictatorship strategy. Counter encirclement tactics. That mean that we have to, uh, technically this is our mission for uh, seems like now. And you could tell that something is wrong if we're the only ones out of black people and, and, and Muslims that's talking about this. Have anybody heard anything like this? But is this really happening? What we're saying, is that, is that happening? Okay, the other thing is, did we outline before it even got off the ground, this is what they're going to do, this is how it's going to happen, and then they're going to come back, and it ain't gonna, they ain't going to be talking about you. And they got it so bad, they've got Negroes acting a the fool. They don't have nothing to do with us talking about, uh, we apologize to the Jewish people for apologizing. What about Black Lives Matter? What about all the stuff you do to us all the time? I'm telling you, we told the people that they won. We're not happy that we're right, but we respect our analysis because it's been correct all the time. Okay, so that means at a certain period in history you develop, you're responsible for certain things. Like when you have knowledge, you're responsible for it a little bit. Okay, now. There's white victims, black victims, brown victims. They are victims of America. They don't even, you think Black Lives Matter? They done took over that, they done took, and we know how they take it over, but they don't know, they don't, they don't, the Muslims, they just think they, they I'm just gonna get a better job, I'm gonna snitch on people so that I won't be too, you know what I mean? It'll be, they're not thinking about dictatorship Hey man, boss man is taking all of your rights. He's violating his constitution. Federal troops, 
or military in the cities, technically the CIA has to work overseas. It can't work inside, technically. The Army Intelligence has to work overseas. Of course, they use all that on us. <laughs> right? What does that mean? That means that uh, we've requested people to move in a certain direction. We've tried to outline for them. And okay, so we have to do something about it now. That's probably tomorrow we'll mention a little bit about what we're going to do. But we're going to mobilize for this and organize for this. So we're going to start all of what we need to do. Probably our headquarters for this would be the house next door, 4481. So we got to get that fixed up. We're going to move all the stuff downstairs. Get a big dumpster or two again and just get rid of everything. We'll probably redo the floors. We're going to make this uh, the headquarters for this movement. That's what we're going to do right now. And tomorrow we'll have a sign-up book. Anybody want to sign up? Anything they can do? Uh, we'll clean up all of what we got right now and put it to proper use. Yeah, we'll put all this stuff to proper use. In the book room, everything. We'll cart everything, pack it all up. But we're going to have a, a daily work schedule where we kind of, you know, the Quran as I had go forth, whether equipped lightly or heavily, and strive and struggle in the way of Allah. And it's best for you if you but knew, if you go not forth in the cause of Allah, He will replace you with another people, and they won't be like, okay. So we don't want to miss this opportunity. You know, for Dawah, for everything, this is the best, this is a, a gift from Allah. Now the Muslims, the fat cat Muslims, they don't see it like this. It's scaring them to death. You know, they get scared when we just come around. Remember we're out there with a box, just going to get a few dollars. Oh, we'll really fix you up. You just stop doing that. For I said, man, I ain't going for that. I know better than that. Then, okay. Man, it was months later they come sending a few bucks and not dollars, just doggone cards. Anyway, that's okay. That's okay. But where, where is the blessing then? Is this such a blessing? Shoot, it's a blessing. Because if, the, if we carry ourselves right, the American people will appreciate that work. It won't be long. They're going to appreciate our lectures out there. They're going to appreciate. The people, you know, it's a small percentage. The little stuff we was doing the other week is just practice for this. We already could see, like, all those people out there was not government agents. 25% of them, just, just a, a random number, we figured one in four of them was real, and they, you could see they appreciated what we would be saying. They never acted on it, though. <laughs> they never acted on it. Wouldn't, they wasn't there to act on it. They never acted on it. Now... We just have to come back and remind them. Remember, we told you guys, boss man, was going to run you all around the block three, four times. Then quiet you down and you go back home and they're going to do da, da 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 It was so, you know, it gets so easy to script what they're going to do. It's ridiculous that that's exactly what they did. Okay. So we've, we've acquired the skill to do this. We've acquired the skill. We've acquired the skill, number one, because we're, we're here. We're here and we're balanced. Well, we feel we're balanced. Uh, we have mastered the techniques We've mastered the technique, everything we've been involved in. And you got to remember, we have a whole parking lot 
full of cars that don't run and trucks that are just parked there. Okay, well, don't worry, we'll get rid of them. But our team is going to fix all that stuff up so we'll be operating properly. In other words, everything that we are, we're going to another stage. And all the other stuff that was happening before today and yesterday was preparation. Remember we were talking about always moving forward and you got a picture of where you're going. Okay, you have a picture of the big target and you're shooting at it. Hopefully you hit the center target. But when you pick the exact center, then you, your aim gets real acute then. You know, you want to hit dead center. We always headed in that direction. We ain't missing the boat on nothing. This is our feeling. And now we'll be shooting directly at the target. And the only way to get any better is when we shoot arrow at the target. I used to shoot archery a long time ago. Is uh, you know one guy, he splits the arrow us, and everybody said, "Boy, that's a bad boy there." You know, the arrow hits the target right where it should, and then the other guy shoots, and he splits the arrow. That's good shooting. That's really good shooting. Uh, Okay, we talked about the great danger of the global lockdown. And we have a secret weapon, our behavior. Now, uh, remember the other day we said that our secret weapon is our openness, our ability to come right out on the, and we ain't got no skeletons in our closet and nothing. Okay, so y'all saw the picture of me uh, getting arrested with, uh, actually, if I wouldn't have put clothes on, I was in the bathroom. I was taking an enema in the masjid in Oakland. The, when I come out with the shirt off and everything. And they know it because they was watching me. They, they've been watching, I don't know how many years. But I know that I used to, I guess y'all wouldn't remember. In 1983, 84, the Russian government was microwaving the U.S. government. Microwave mean that, imagine, they built a new U.S. embassy in Russia with Russian workers. And they put all kind of metal rods and receivers, all of that in the concrete. And then they'd be right across the street just microwaving being, they, they was making the people sick. They was doing everything to the American embassy. And I remember that period <clears throat> around 1984, I was in the masjid and I, I always stayed in the masjid. And I heard a little ringing like stuff. So I said, hmm. I just turn on the radio. That's why I listen to the radio all the time now. Whoever you come in, my, the radio is on. When I turn on the radio, all that stuff stopped. Whatever was being piped toward me was the radio, you know, the waves in those days. Now they got something to go through it around it. But at that time, their sophistication was not to the point that it could interfere with the radio waves from the radio. And all of a certain, I, as soon as I turned it on, no ear ringing, no nothing. You know, no disturbances. Because if they do that stuff to you long enough, you know, you might get start getting a little uh, batty. You know, hearing noises and what have you. Now you got to remember, I don't want to change the subject. <clears throat> The uh, Navy Yard shooting and all that stuff. What did that brother say? I was hearing voices. 
he went to the FBI and told them someone was suggesting that he do stuff like that. And he told them that up there and up. And the FBI just said, it's all right, you know, take a couple of aspirins. In other words, they knew what they were doing. Boss man is mean. Boss man is real mean. And if you're, okay, my sons, both of them told me, they said, Dad, uh, you got to be careful uh, uh, because they got where they can see you. I said, well, they can't see nothing but somebody nigga masturbating or something. That's all they can see. Remember I said that exactly? Okay, that's true. What they was doing with my sons was showing me to them. And my sons is tattletales for recently, last few years. They're good brothers. They're all right. They lasted a long time. I mean, can you imagine? They lasted 15 and 20 years. They just started telling uh, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, who's going to last all those years, right? And you like Harrod, and you like uh, uh, what, that crack and all that stuff. You know, all that morality go away. So I said, they ain't going to be able to see nothing but uh, that. That's all they're going to see. So last night I got a call from Khadijah. If you want to call Khadijah, you could call and verify this. Because, see, you got to test everything now. Remember, I know what I'm talking about because I test everything. He called last night, and you can see on the, on the phone, it has uh, last night if you don't. Let me see. See that, that number, 510, da-da-da-da-da? Yeah, that's her number. So she called last night. Your hand must be broke. I just hung the phone up. So, you know, the brother's unmarried, so they do different things from time to time. That's exactly. So, 100%, they see everything I do, have done, and except what I might get ready to do. But people that's married do that. That ain't nothing, right? Tell the truth. A nigga can have a wife sitting there and he, you know, going through his little changes. It's the most natural thing that exists. So that's what I'm saying. You can't hold nothing over me. I ain't got no skeleton in my closet. And that proves just up to modern time. That proves, another thing, it, it proves the skill to manage and manipulate the government. No, you got to realize the skill to anticipate and to manipulate. That's why, look, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, them, they didn't have time. They didn't have no time. They were victims. Victims mean that, you know, they were just victims of government oppression. Okay, we might have started out as a victim just like everybody else, but that was over 40 years ago. For the last 40 years, when we opened the masjid and opened, for all of that time, we've been, for the last 35 years, we have not been victims. We have been, uh, I'll put it this way, the closer we get to the day, the more, the closer we get to our own freedoms and what have you. Because since y'all have been here the last decade, we, uh, we've been managing our own business. There's no way you can say this is what boss man going to do, that's what boss man going to do all the time, and that's what he do. Tell the truth, unless you got his number, unless you got him on the hook. See, boss man, 
that longevity, that endurance, that hanging on over long periods of time, our brothers didn't have that chance. They didn't get anywhere close to where we are. That's why that lady was talking that old talk about, you say you, uh, Malcolm, you. Look, let me explain. Malcolm King, all the Panthers, all of my friends that got killed and assaulted and, and rotten in prisons, they didn't have time. The government has a tried and true pattern of behavior since past Pharaoh's time. It's the same one. They kill the men and leave the women folk alive, or we hear that there's some little messenger or somebody going to be born, kill them all. What age he going to be? Well, he might be two years old, five years old. He might just kill everybody from five years old on down. That's all. Kill them all. Right? Can you imagine? That's biblical, that's Quranic, and that's real. In Esau's time, right? That's what they, they said. Hey, man, we ain't taking no chances. Good. This is, okay, now what about niggas? Kill the men, lead the women, folk alive. Okay, that was a trial for them. They did burn the brothers. Not only did they burn the brothers, but they gave sisters jobs. And that destroys a brother because a man want to take care of his family. So every time he come in the house and the woman got a job, and she talking to him like he lazy and he can't get a job, well, he feels bad and he might brutalize her, he might do anything because he, he don't understand what's going on. Okay, they know what's going on. They know, a white man know that if he can't take care of his family, he'll kill himself. You know what I mean? That boy jump off a bridge. You know, some of them. Uh, and so Negroes may just beat up everybody in the neighborhood. They probably won't jump off a bridge. But by the time he finished with drugs and alcohol and all that time in prison, and, and look how dirty it is. The laws, if you're on welfare or anything like that, you can't have, what, a man in the house. Make sure the family, we ain't having that family stuff, right? We're not having it. And everything that they have set up is there to destroy the black family. Drugs, alcoholism, attitudes. How many revolutionary movies came out during the revolutionary period? Not one. That old thing, Spook Set by the Door, uh, was after the fact and it wasn't that real. How many superflies? How many all at the Mac? Right? Why you can't make two or three black power movies, you know, where the head of the leaders, black power, nigga, you know that. Type. Do they know what they're doing? Absolutely, they know exactly what they're doing. They've been doing it with perfection and excellence. What I'm saying is, our longevity, our period of staying, and our period of making sure that we know the line. Where you cross that line, you know, you say it's something where they can take you to jail. You're advocating violence. So we talk about boss man, oh, he's a fool, he's a bum. But we don't never say, now nah, you go down there and uh, snatch him out of the White House. That's illegal. But we can tell you where the White House is, we can tell you how many people are hanging out down there. We can tell you all of that. But we can't say, now you go down there and get him. Of course, that's according to their constitution, right? What about now that we're the transition? The saying was, if you come for me in the morning, we don't come for you tonight. If they come for niggas before, they're coming for everybody. All America feels oppressed now. They, they, they just feel oppressed. 
the white people, the governors. Can you imagine if the governors is feeling paranoid? Hey, okay, now. We're going to explain all of these things to people and it just might be possibilities that everything that we've been planning, you can never know what the numbers are going to look like. We've always said 5, 10, 15 percent of the FBI themselves. Right. They got a few whistleblowers every now and then. They get beat up pretty bad. But now imagine the people in the government are now saying that we don't go along with that. So are the voices going to get louder or are they going to get quieter? With Don, Don demands buffoonery. Don ain't going to leave a stone unturned. If he can, I, that's why we say they, they hired Don to do that. That boy, look here, three cheers for Don. But I'm telling you, now us, so that means this Adolf Hitler show, this safety security hoax, is a super hypocrisy. It's the longest war. So we have to develop or practice what we've been discussing, strategic depth. This thing has to go deep. But we're going to use intelligence that uh, people didn't realize that we have. We're going to tell this story so that it's not offensive. And we're going to keep telling it and telling it. And pretty soon, we're going to win middle class recognition. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. Because when, in order to have a successful transformation, you have to win a certain amount of the middle strata of society. You just have to. The so-called petty intelligentsia, the people who are freedom-loving, the so-called good people of America. Yeah. That's why we've always talked about America the good. And we've guaranteed everybody that we ain't got nothing in mind but what we say. So if you want to do something, you go ahead and do it. But this is what we're working on, right? This is our project. If you don't like it, you can kiss our behind. You disappear, nigga. You disappear, everybody else. No, really. That's the way I feel. If you don't like it, just disappear somebody. You know, it's easy to say that when you're 75 years old and you didn't had everything that they, now, I don't know if I'd say that if I was 20, 21, or to just disappear, nigga, then if you don't like it. I don't know. But after, see, I do know about gratefulness and Allah allowing you to move through things. And the question will always arise. Why I slipped through? Why this? You know, why that? Why all the homeboys? You know what I mean? Just imagine if you got a whole crew that you were around, associated with, and everybody get disappeared or rot in prison. And you know, when we get close to getting Imam Jamil out of prison and raising more money, what do they do? They just shut us down. They said they 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 don't they can't shut you down, but they make it so hard for you to get money. You just got enough to feed yourself, and not enough to do the other things. Well, we stretching out uh, the strategic depth. I mean that we uh, let's call it strategic brilliance. The Negro's ability to use strategic imagination, strategic imagination, that it is structured visualization, organized visualization. And 
is something real about it or technically, you know, uh, it's just the little raggedy buildings here and there, but the other people don't have nothing. When the white man roll on them, they, they don't leave nothing. They don't look. <laughs> I don't want to say this, but technically we don't have a, a whole lot of nothing, but we don't need nothing. We're going to do what we're doing. If we didn't have nothing, we'd just stand outside and do what we're talking about now. We'll stand outside and do it. Yeah, we'll stand outside, sleep in the car, you know, sleep under a bridge. Yeah, that's, that's what it costs. Those are the costs. And that's why we said this time we were specific about sleeping under a bridge. Although it don't look like we're going to have to, but we're prepared. Because you have to be prepared to risk everything, everything to accomplish. Okay, other people are different. They have a little house, they have a little, have a little job, a little income. And they want to protect that. I, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that. So anybody that comes here regularly, we're going to have a sign-up sheet. We'll put it out tomorrow. But this is an overview about what uh, 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 this is uh, you know, I feel sorry for the immigrant community because they want to be loved by America. They do. Uh, you can't stop them. You could just, and when I say America, I mean kind of Euroish America, not me and you. You ever seen a white person t take jihada and they fall on the floor and they just do everything? And the poor Negro, well, me too, I took jihada. Is <laughs> it good for you? Yeah, they almost ready to say stop for a lie, <laughs> right? Hey, man, it's it's sad, but remember, Islam is so I almost want to call it delicious. That's what Islam is, and Islam help you understand people, and you don't blame people for being people, right? Because the shaitan say, I'm going to hit them from over here, over here, front, behind, boy, and you ain't going to find. And he's talking to Allah. After Allah give him probation for a time, and Allah ain't going to break his word. Okay, you got it. Now is what I'm going to do. Since I got this little period, bad as I am, you made me out of fire. You made that nigga out of dust. You ain't going to find hardly none of them. And actually, Shaitan is usually, he, he's kind of close to right sometimes. The majority of the people, no matter what you do, they're not going to, uh, we have to be prepared for that. The other thing that we have to expect, if we expect good from people, it's a bigger chance of good coming out of the people. If we expect it, you may not get good out of it. But if you expect the people to do right, you hope that they do right, you manage, you set up a structure, a system that brings the best out of people, right? Okay, what comes out of them is for them. Remember, we're not doing nothing for ourselves. Uh, when I, <clears throat> no, we're trying to get, ain't no sense of telling no story, we're trying to get to heaven, you know, stuff like that. And heaven ain't stuff like that. Heaven is not just a, that means there's a past, there's a present, there was a time when you wasn't even around. You didn't exist. Then there's the present where you're here. And you're going to be given a new body when you leave here that's going to be able to bear Pleasure, unbelievable. And pain, unbelievable. Pain, the, the books say this stuff pop up, burn your arm, it's going to zip skin, come right back on. You're going to be burning up so bad, you're going to try to drink down something that's going to be hotter than 
everything. Hey, it's called Scared Street. <clears throat> Here's what I had. Ali Radi Allah who said, Oh, I worship you a lot not to gain your paradise or to avoid your hellfire. I worship you because you deserve to be worshipped. That's big. That's big. That's big. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, a little bit of time and evolution is, is really important. Now remember, so, somebody was talking about uh, a king and he was talking about Malcolm and I was trying to explain this. I said, look, Malcolm, those are our heroes. You know, that's who uh, I wanted to, well at first I wanted to be like Al Capone. And guess what? I got a chance to do that. Just like Big Al, you know. I mean, I lived like, you know. Now, that was artificial. Why? That was a TV program I saw when I was 17, 62. Al Capone, Desilu Playhouse, you know. I said, man. And I said in my mind, I would like to do that. You know, just 17 year old Negro on the street of those days. What the heck? I'd like to drive up to my car, my house, my mama's house, give her a big stack of money, $1,000. That's what I was having in those days. And I forgot it. I went on off and went to jail. And I came out. And everybody, when I left, there was a few people smoking weed. When I came home, everybody was smoking weed. Everybody was getting high. And I used to take a carload of brothers over to, uh, to the temple in San Francisco. And I, I didn't smoke weed. I didn't eat meat. I didn't do none of that at that time. And so I was getting a contact high because everybody was smoking weed on the way over there. And I would ask them, how much you buy this for? How much you sell it for? Uh, do you have a lot of it? They said, no. They told me the same story every other day. Uh, it's not a regular connection. We don't have, uh, you know, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's dry. Da -da 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 -da. And I had said when I was 17, if I would have lived during prohibition, I would have been a gangster. That's what I said to myself. No, subliminal suggestion. That means is some suggested in your mind. You understand it and da 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 da, but it's not in the front of your mind. It will seep back there somewhere. And I said, if I would have lived during prohibition, I would have been a gangster. Start selling marijuana. And got rich. And why? Because I was regular. Supplier, I said, well, what do they need? They need this all the time. And I never ran out. I bought enough for, I was regular, you know, you could, whenever you came to me. One time I was down in LA getting this thing and I was on the way back and I called my partner and I said, are we out yet? I was on the way back with the little package. He said, well, there's a few people sitting here and we'd have just sold the last few half of cans and everything. And I so said, I'd just tell them to hold there or wait, I'll be, you know, I was on the highway coming on in, or on the plane coming on in. Never ran out, never, just never ran out. A regular supplier, the best product at the best price. Hey, you can't, you know, you get big fat whatever you're supposed to get and it's at a cheaper price than everybody else's. So you get rich. Everybody like you. Anyway, so you get a chance to live that artificial lifestyle. Then you look up, you say, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't no whole lot of nothing. It sure looks good. But this ain't nothing. Then you get a chance to travel around the world and do all that other stuff. 
and then come to Islam. Then, just before you get to Islam, you get a chance to go to South America and you become the first Negro cocaine supplier in the United States. That's not bad. And the money that you don't give to the movement, you just go turn yourself in, fight your case, lose it, of course. Then you come out, come out as a Muslim, ready to go. The point is Allah give you a chance to see all of that stuff. When you're in prison, you're studying, how did you get in the prison? Well, they just told me they did this, right? When you travel all around the world, wherever Malcolm went, we was right behind him, five years. Imam Jamil, we was one year behind him. Whenever we get somewhere overseas, Imam Jamil or H. Rap Brown was here. Oh, yeah? So there's a difference, though. All of our brothers got set up or didn't get the game on how to avoid boss man. Or you just blessed and you got a special job to do. And so you can see everything, get involved in everything, and miss it. Because the Quran, is, anything that was meant to hit you, it's going to hit you. Anything that was meant to miss you, it's going to miss you. It don't make no difference, right? That's the, what the religious scriptures say to us. That when you learn that, that anything that was meant to hit you, it's going to hit you. Anything that was meant to miss you, it's going to miss you. So anything that's been missing us, now, it ain't been missing that much. Imagine the stuff we put up with. If, if what you see is 3 or 4% of what's going on, really, the maximum. Can you imagine? Just let your mind flow a little. Of what we've been dealing with. That was to train us. That was to teach us. And that was also to instruct everybody else on possibilities, on what we can do. What we can be. They say it can't be done. We're living proof. They can't say it's not possible. But you can. And it's at the time when big boss man is in a decline. Right? This is, his glory days is over. No, his glory days. You can call it. He can call, it don't make no difference what we do. Boss man. Boss man then picked on the baddest jokers in the world. He even picked on China. It's not old China, it's new China. Soviet Union. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to show you. You know, Russia is eight time zones. Do you know the sun never set, talking about the British Empire, the sun never set today on Russia. If the sun is eight time zones, in one country, six million square miles. Good God of my Eight time zones. You know, there's three time zones. What is it? Yes, in the time, Eastern time. In the U.S., in Russia, is eight time zones. So the sun is setting here, it's rising over there. The sun is rising over there, it's setting over here. And they didn't pick, yeah, we don't like you. We don't like you, Venezuela. You got more oil than anybody in the, in the world. And they holding on. Iran, holding on. Remember the old days when boss man said, jump, you could just ask how high. Not now. Boss man missing the boat. Anyway, we're going to speed up. That's our new mission. We don't want to uh, wear you out. Uh, but we're going to use all of what we have right here. This is the new headquarters for this process that we're getting into right now. And this is what we're going to do. And this with Allah's help. And this is just a, a wonderful, we're not only going to mobilize people, but we're going to organize people and we're going to direct people.
And we've been heading this way all the time. It's just the last few things drop in, and that's what's happening now. Are there any questions or any comments about anything? Okay, anything else? Um, yeah, so another person commented and said, uh, drugs make America rich, Trump will do nothing. Of course, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, of That's course. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's just asking, you know, what's your opinion on what those types are doing in this particular case? What guys going to be doing this Saturday, I guess. Okay. Uh, technically, we've, uh, we wish everybody success in whatever endeavor that they're, that they're working on. Everybody will not and probably could not have the same view of uh, this situation. But from our research, from our 50 something years, a little more than that, of experience, we have developed what we call nonviolent resistance. Nonviolent resistance. And a part of nonviolent resistance is alternative resistance. And we researched it. We've been, and, and I know all the people that, uh, you know, like I'm from Oakland, so all the Panthers, all of this and all of that, we had a chance to study in detail all of those approaches. And just to be brief, we found that those approaches have not been working in the past. They just haven't worked in the past because uh, uh, the level of infiltration and sabotage. Uh, I just learned when I was in Leavenworth and other places, and I learned from experience that the numbers was of infiltrators, saboteurs, and all of that was just unbelievable. Now, what is alternative resistance? That's the people. You resist participating in the system, but you have an alternative system. We always say the church, the mosques, the synagogues, where we pull away from the system, but all the problems that we have in the community, right, we solve them. So you don't have to call the police. If you have drugs, say the churches here. This church, or this five churches, they're going to handle drugs. You know what I mean. They're going to drugs, treatment, counseling, and all that. Okay, the other few, they're going to handle homelessness. Because they might have facilities for home. And all the counseling and feeding and everything that go with homelessness. Okay, that's alternative resistance. That means you're resistant by doing the things yourself. Right? So when you do the things yourself, in revolution, if your main people are fighting and in the bush, when you get power, you know what you know how to do? Fight in the bush. 
you have no understanding of the structure and the organizational process. You don't, have, you don't know how to solve the problems of society. We say we'll solve them first and we'll develop that alternative resistance. So we're not supporting the system, but we haven't altered. That's our approach. Uh, we wish everybody well, but uh, that's uh, in everything they do, but that's, that's, that's our approach. And we'll cooperate with people, whatever they, uh, you know, like we, we're, you know, we're happy for them. You know, we're not, you know what I mean? We're not uh, all our way or the highway. No, that's not true. It's a lot, this is a big thing. So we're not going to try to <clears throat> narrow the approaches to the same thing. Uh, any more questions or comments? Well, actually, I had a question. It was, um, maybe you could clarify our position. I know, you know, we're a lot of the you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. pioneers. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I saw a lot of them. Yeah. But that kind of leads to us not necessarily being institution builders. Is that accurate to say? Mm -mm. No. Okay. What we're doing, this is, remember, mobilization first, we're getting together, and organization. The stage we're stepping into right now is, of course, first you are doing both to, together, mobilizing and organizing. Remember, you have to be, why do we want to work with the churches? Because they already have the institutions, they have the money, they have the people already, right? All the churches, they got the money, they got the people, and they had ideology. Love your neighbor, right? Okay. We as Muslims, we have that too. All of the religious institutions that's why we started with religious institutions first, because they have the ideology. Love your neighbor, peace on earth, and all that. Already got it. All of us got that. People and wealth. You have the organizational structure. Everything is there. Everything is already here. Just imagine. The only thing, they're not using it because they've been diverted from religion. In the past, religion was always what? The church, the masjid was a sanctuary. They used the name for Mecca as a sanctuary, a refuge where you go for refuge, okay? So the organizational structure and all of it is there is that people have been diverted away from the original idea. See, Zaka, Sadaka, all that. Okay. You go into the, most of the churches, they make a joyful noise to the Lord. They sing. They raise thousands of dollars 